Hi, I'm Norm Robbins with ReinoArts.News, and I'm here with Maestro Kelly Kuo, who will be conducting our Reno Chamber Orchestra this Saturday and Sunday. Welcome, Maestro. Thank you, Norm. Happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Normally, I would start by asking about yourself, uh, and then about the music you play, but uh, these are different times. So your business is a peripatetic business. You go from here to there to the other place. Tell us how this coronavirus is affecting you. It's more affecting our, my line of work in terms of how all of my colleagues are affected. I'm seeing use of uh, necessary closures of performing arts venues uh, right now in the East Coast and Pacific Northwest in particular. And freelance artists depend on the service wages that they get. And given the circumstances, a lot of players and singers are losing out on substantial income as a result. And that, of course, is a long-term impact on not just individuals, but also the art form. And so as far as me, I, I have been fortunate to escape a lot of those at this point, but at the same time, I see all my colleagues uh, expressing sorrow and worry and uh, just concern about their own futures. And they have you know, rightful, their rightful uh, thought process behind that is, is of concern to me. I'll bet it is. Well, if it's of any interest to you and to our public, uh, Reno people are made of sterner stuff, and this weekend the show will go on. Absolutely, that's what we've been told. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. You're from Oregon. I grew up actually in a desert, not dissimilar to Reno, except without the mountains, a very, very flat uh, part of northeastern Oregon in a tiny farming community of 10,000. I say tiny only because, comparatively speaking, it is tiny, but it was actually the biggest city in northeastern Oregon at the time. Okay. We were famous for watermelons and there was no orchestra program to speak of. Um, in the, there was, I guess, maybe a few amateur orchestras in the community, mm -hmm. in Pendleton and Walla Walla, Washington, the Tri-Cities, and those were my musical influences growing up, in addition to um, a couple music directors of band programs that I grew up playing clarinet through, and uh, a wonderful set of circumstances that allowed me to even consider playing a musical instrument, let alone pursuing a musical career. And it just happened to be because of clarinet that I had the opportunity to, to pursue music because a recruiter from the University of Oregon had come through. All the rural communities looking for people to play an instrument in the marching band or win ensemble and potentially earn scholarships. And so in the area no bigger than this area that we're here, I played an audition, uh, 10 minutes unaccompanied on clarinet. That was my audition for the University of Oregon, okay. as well as a videotape of my piano playing. And that got me a full ride in music. And for the oldest son of an immigrant Asian family, that's really the only thing that allowed me to even consider pursuing it because I should have otherwise been pursuing medicine or law or engineering. Well, if you're, <clears throat> if you're born and if you're the first born son in a Chinese family, you should be pursuing your father's business. Yes, and my father was <laughs> hoping that one, either my brother or I would be interested in taking over his business, but unfortunately, neither of us uh, came up to that standard. <laughs> okay. So, you weren't born into a musical family then? No, it skipped a generation. Both of my grandfathers were amateur musicians themselves. My mother's father was an elementary school music teacher, and my, okay. gran my father, my, my grandfather's on my dad's side, played violin amateurly. And so all my, my parents and their siblings, they both came from large families. My mom came from, is the youngest of seven. My dad is the third of six. And so none of them studied music. But all of their children. You are, you are we a all generation. Of us, we were all required to study music in some capacity. And it just became part of expectation, I think. I think there was just, not necessarily an expectation of pursuing it full time. I think just part of growing up in the musical culture, um, they felt was all very, very much important. I'm the only one who considered it uh, past just a, some part of your learning and education. Mm -hmm. and I was the only one who actually went forward with a career. And I'm very, very thankful because my parents went way above and beyond the call of duty. I, I can tell you a very funny story, actually. There was a time when, 
I was uh, in my high school years, maybe junior year or something like that, senior year, and I'd outgrown the clarinet teachers in the area, so they sent me to a teacher in Portland, which is about a three and a half hour drive. My brother, younger brother, was playing trombone, and he also took lessons in Portland. So we'd go maybe once every four or five weeks to Portland and make it a family trip. We'd wake up early on Saturday, still in our pajamas, dark outside. Mm -hmm. We had a family van with the back seats folded up, and we'd sleep for half the way. And then in the, a city called The Dalles, which is the midway point, we'd get up, have our McDonald's ritual, change our clothes, and then for the last hour and a half of that trip, my brother and I would take turns for 45 minutes practicing our instruments in the van as my parents <coughs> drove to Portland. So can you imagine hearing a trombone or a clarinet <laughs> practice in that close, close in, proximity? Inside, inside a closed vehicle. Inside a closed vehicle. Oh, grown. <laughs> I'm not sure if I do that for my own children. So <laughs> my parents were <coughs> extremely uh, supportive of what it took to get the best kind of uh, instruction. Got Even it. though none of them were planning for us to go further with it. Do you, concept. okay, let's talk about your music. <clears throat> There's an old saying in warfare, take no prisoners, bayonet the wounded. Mm -hmm. And I used to think it applied only to warfare and stock market investing. And then I heard Kevin Lau's Artemis, and I thought, wow, this is warlike stuff. Mm -hmm. Take no prisoners, banging at the wounded. Tell us about this piece. <laughs> well, it definitely comes from a portrayal of a fearless character, someone who is an avenging angel type of character. It's a woman, which is very different than what we might expect from warfare. Um, and so there's a little bit of a difference. It's not violence for the sheer sake of brute force violence. It's more skillful, much more precise, and uh, very tribal in its, in its scope and sound. It reminds me of superhero movies. It conjures up um, you know, Lord of the Rings sometimes it, in its landscapes, that, the tonal landscapes that are portrayed by the orchestra. There's some great themes that could very much be out of the Avengers movies. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also some very sympathetic uh, passages of respite where there's almost a period of mourning uh, from the ensemble in relationship to all of the violence that it might have occurred before and after. That's the second part. That's correct. Is it correct to call it the second movement? I mean, is yes, he gives a okay. title to the second, second okay. part. Each of the movements, each of the sections are, even though it's a uh, continuous play, they are la labeled sections. So the first movement is Genghis Khan's golden horde slaughtering everything in its path. Mm -hmm. And the second movement is very peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's describing the islands where, it's an homage to the islands where Artemis and her brother Apollo grew up yeah. and were raised. Um, and but it's, it's unfortunately short. <laughs> well, apparently whatever triggers Artemis' uh, bloodlust. That, yes, exactly. <laughs> People can't stop pushing her buttons, obviously. And so she has to take, I guess, revenge on those who attack things that, meaning, that mean a lot to her. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful piece. The one performance of it I've seen, there was every percussion instrument on stage but a triangle, mm -hmm. and uh, including a Chinese gong. Have you got a Chinese gong for this performance? Well, we have a gong, and it has a Chinese character on it. I'm not sure if it was it made in China. Big, big gong? It's not a big gong no. at this point. Um, it's a little it's, gong? It's in between. <clears throat> Let's just say it's a medium-sized gong. And Okay. It, it's probably a, the largest percussion battery you will ever see for a chamber orchestra. Okay. Um, but it has a lot of powerful uh, um, attributes. And it's something that if you are not awake when you watch the concert to begin with, you will be awake after two measures. Okay. Well, you're, and on Sunday, I know you're going to have an old audience, so that might be good. Mm -hmm. They won't have trouble <laughs> hearing those first two bars, I guarantee you. Okay. Let's talk about the Shostakovich Cello Concerto Number no. 1. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I'm a little bit of a history buff, so I know what happened in the Soviet Union. 1917, the, uh, the battleship Aurora goes up to the Winter Palace in Leningrad and says, 
Okay, everybody named Romanov, get out or we're gonna blow the place up. They got out, Lenin took over. Lenin had two people working for him. One was Stalin, who was his, his butcher, his enforcer, his gunsel. Mm -hmm. And the other was Lee, Leon, what we call Leon Trotsky, the Russians call him Lev Trotsky. And he was the one who built the Red Army. Mm -hmm. And he said to Lenin, do you want quality or quantity? And Lenin said, quantity has its own quality. I disagree with that. It took mm. me a while to reach that conclusion, but I'm not so sure. Anyhow, Lenin ended up with, a, with an ice pick, in the, not an ice pick, a rock pick in his head in Mexico, and Stalin took over. Mm -hmm. And then we got uh, socialist realism, where the arts had to support the state. And poor Shostakovich tried so much to please Stalin, and how often did he do that? Oh, quite a bit, but at the same time, there was always a ripple of this bitterness and resentment against yeah. that throughout all of his music. You can hear, even though he was trying to please and not you know, create too many waves so that mm. he would be executed, yeah. uh, you can hear the, his inner turmoil yes. emotionally in all of his writing. Okay, that's interesting. Let, let's, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the piece itself. Everybody knows Beethoven Fifth Symphony, da, 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 you know, which stands for victory, which, which was Winston Churchill, so Hitler banned the fifth. Uh, he starts off his first cello concerto with four notes. Mm -hmm. I think he plays it twice. Mm -hmm. What's he building from there? Well, those four notes are based upon his name, uh, Dmitry Shostakovich, and that's something that he used quite a bit, using those, the German equivalent of those letters to create um, a motif per se. Got it. So he's basically, uh, even for those who didn't know the code, those who did would realize that he's in, infusing his music with his name, personality, emotions, everything. That's very interesting. I had no idea of that. Mm -hmm. and, and he was pressed by Mr. Slav Rasvaprovich to write a cello concerto. He wrote two. Um, what was Rasvaprovich's influence? on cello concerto number one. Well, it was written for him, obviously, but he was the, the imminent Russian virtuoso on cello, and so everyone wanted to write for him. And Shostakovich heard Prokofiev uh, cello concerto that very much gave him a framework to start working on his own cello concerto. And of course he wrote it for Rostropovich, but Rostropovich didn't know he was writing it for him yet. Mm -hmm. And he got wind of it and, of course, wrote a letter and said, I'd love to see it. And so there's a the urban legend goes that uh, Rostropovich got the music and had it memorized four days later. I read that. <clears throat> it's one of those things that it, it may even be true, but it certainly makes the rounds. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a lot of great stories around this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the one where after he's memorized it, he's asked Shostakovich to come over and play it with them. So they played it through one time, had a good old time, so they did it again and kept on drinking. And each time they played it through, Rostropovich said something like to the fact, the last time through, I think he was playing Schumann and I was playing Shostakovich. <laughs> we all had a great old time. And uh, Rostropovich, uh, of course, gave the premiere and it, it has remained in the repertoire okay. uh, because of its unique structure. Okay. And there's this massive cadenza, which is the entire third movement. You don't hear the orchestra at all in the third movement because it's only cello. And then it launches into this uh, amazing dance in the in very very intense dance in the fourth movement that bring it to a close let's let's go back to russian history <clears throat> so 1953 i believe stalin dies uh 1955 or so khrushchev gets the guts to 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 disown to blast stalin to get rid of socialist realism uh 1958 uh the composers are made free to compose as they wish. 1959, Shostakovich publishes this. Supposedly he wrote it in the summer. And there's stories about him writing drawer music that didn't make Stalin happy. And it was music that he composed that he put in a drawer. Mm -hmm. Drawer music. And I wonder, can you compose a cello concerto in, in the summer or do you need to go to a drawer full of music to, to compose it? <laughs> you know, I, the world of composition is so unique to find your own voice and how you have music written in you 
that just needs to come out. It's, there's certainly, uh, it's understandable if you find yourself writing music that needs to come out that you know will offend authorities in a way that just jeopardizes your own life and put it into a drawer. So I wouldn't put it past anyone to hide music that they've written if they find that it could potentially uh, cost them their own lives. But at the same time, it's music that needs to come out. So it needs to come out on paper. Speaking of music that's in you, let's segue over to Beethoven. Beethoven's Second Symphony. He knew he was going deaf. He was going deaf for years. Uh, it tortured him. He considered suicide. He wrote a letter to his brother considering suicide, never sent it to them, mm -hmm. the two brothers. Uh, but he made the comment in his writing, in his writing to his friends, uh, I, I can't commit suicide. There's so much music in me, it just has to come out. Mm -hmm. Which is ironic to my mind because he was tortured during the composing of the Second Symphony. Absolutely. And yet, there's nothing in there except for. Uh, lyric, beautiful music, and humorous music. Very, very witty and sometimes over the top bodily function imitation. And just that one going, I missed. You bodily missed function <laughs> imitation? Yes, there's can, a fourth movement. You, well, you, let's imagine bodily functions that come out maybe. Can you say it on camera? Um, let's just say excess <laughs> gases that have to be released <laughs> either from the forward end or the back end. <laughs> And he was known to um, revel in bodily function sounds. And so there's a rumor that he actually imitated that in the fourth movement and just had a lot of fun doing that with all these outbursts. I'll, I'll listen for it. I'm ready for it now okay. because last, last night our publisher and glorious cameraman Dana Nolsch and I uh, did a preview of The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere. Mm. Uh, so I guess this, this bodily emanations is more common than I thought. <laughs> it's, as far as I know, as long as human beings have, al have been alive, bodily functions have existed. Oh yes, it's, it's just not parlor talk. Yes, exactly. Anyhow. So you can imagine for someone to have put it into music potentially, okay. um, what that kind of revolutionary approach might have caused in, into the audience and you know, the last one third of the fourth movement is all a coda. That is also sort of like sticking your 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 uh, thumb, up your okay. nose, to try to tell tell the audience, audience what a coda is. Coda please. is like the last uh, tail end per se of. It literally means tail in Italian. The tail end of a movement of an of, of a piece. In this case, usually you have a form, you know, that comes A B A predictable, and then you have sort of just a tail end that's short, so it wraps everything up into a nice bow and puts a button on it okay. for the audience. Well, this becomes a very extended tale. So you've had your regular movement, and when people are expecting it just to end, it continues, and it continues again. It's, not, it's constant laughter at the art form, or the, the architectural forms, expectations of the audience. So much so that you, even the critics said that um, the tale, the, it's like a dragon's tail that never, as a writhing animal trying to die and it won't. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what someone described uh, at the end of Beethoven's Second Symphony. We, we do like to mock ourselves, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, I really look forward to your performance. And as a coda, would you like to say something to the good people of Reno? Like, show up. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to make some really fun music to uh, this, this week and hope to have you there to enjoy it. I think it's going to be a great time. Um, our soloist, Bian Tseng, is a friend of the Reno community and has been so for a long time. And he's looking forward to coming back and, and playing this giant masterpiece of the cello repertoire. And I think we're just going to have a great old time. So I hope you can join us. Thank you, Maestro Quo. Would you, would you like, as the times indicate, give me an Ebola bump? Absolutely. There we go. 